I'll start with the first case. We had a five-year-old male child who had presented with a progressive kyphoidic deformity involving the upper thoracic spine. He was already taking an AKT for eight months. He had a gradually progressive spastic paraparesis. And uh, you, if you have a look at an MRI, uh, we are not surprised to see this kind of an MRI at KM Hospital where we see this MDR cox with rampant destruction of the vertebral column. If you can appreciate, his D4 vertebral body is touching almost a D11 vertebral body. So this child at the age of five has lost half of his thoracic spinal column. And as there was an indentation on the spinal cord, we proceeded with a decompression and did a posterior instrumentation from all the posterior approach. We could, uh, re he, he recovered the neurology by the day 14. He could stand with support by the end of three and a half weeks. But by the end of two years, if you see carefully, he has not regained much of the trunk length. His breathing is still uh, shallow. And at the end of four years also, you can see not much uh, regain in the trunk height. This is like a lock box. His thorax has become like a lock box. And the way you have to breathe in a lock box is shallow and rapid. These kids spend more than two times the effort that we spend for a normal breathing in and breathing out of the air. So they, lo they lose a lot of calories in that. Their nighttime sleep quality is also poor because of alveolar hypoventilation. So uh, the, uh, at night usually our muscles are at rest but they spend more energy so their daytime quality becomes poor, they uh, become sedentary and over a period of time they lose a lot of uh, muscle mass. And ironically if you do a BMI it will come normal because we, we are using a recorded height so one should be very careful to measure a, a, a arm span for measuring their uh, BMI uh, to know the nutritional status. Not only the kids below 10 years where our lungs are growing, but also the older uh, individuals like this female with a 13 year old female presented to us with a severe actual back pain, difficulty in walking uh, with a precarious neurology. Again on an MRI, if you see there is a destruction which is fulminant from D10 to L3 vertebral body, internal salient which is compressing on the spinal cord. These are her pre-op and post-op CT scan where you can see that there is a preserved posterior elements and a significant destruction of the anterior column which we uh, instrumented from posteriorly and we recovered the neurology. But the problem is that we are not able to regain the length of the vertebral column which is still an uh, issue for us in the long term. These are the post-operative x-ray. You can see that there is a deformity which is going low in the uh, lumbar spine and this is a, uh, a pre-op and post-operative comparison. Traditionally as an orthopedic surgeon we have been trained to look more at a white but uh, at the end of this talk, I expect that you also look at a black. So if you see uh, uh, in a lateral view, uh, look at the amount of diaphragm being stretched here. We know that the diaphragm has an attachment up to L1 and L2 vertebra. Post-operatively, that stretching becomes uh, less. You can see the dome of the diaphragm has recovered uh, significantly, which is not the case in a pre-operative period. And we are also not surprised to see this kind of a PFT report when we refer these uh, individuals for pulmonary function testing that there is a poor uh, exercise tolerance or poor respiratory efforts uh, so PFT cannot be done. Uh, this is the most important slide in my presentation uh, which basically depicts the three stages of pulmonary development in a human being. Normally we are at peak of our pulmonary reserve by the age of 20. I hate to tell you this that we start losing our reserve uh, by the age of 30 and between 30 to 60 we lose almost 600 to 700 uh, vital, uh, cap cc of vital capacity. So imagine if you don't reach to cow A and if you reach to B or for verse C, you have a very rapid decline with the aging. What is more important is this Lakshman ratio, this horizontal line. Basically on the left side you have FEC percent of normal at the age of 20 and this is the age. This Lakshman ratio varies from the literature to literature between 40 to 60. This is the basic minimum level of pulmonary reserve one has to have. If your reserve are below that, then you have a very high likelihood of succumbing to pulmonary morbidity and mortality if something bad happens. And we have seen in this pandemic the bad which likely happen uh, is uh, respiratory infections. And depending on your pulmonary reserve, you have a chance to survive as opposed to succumb from it. So my point is that as we are going to age, we are going to lose our pulmonary reserve and this will not catch up with you early but over a long time. And how does the spinal tuberculosis affects the vertebral column? If you see, this, uh, 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 as you all know, the spinal tuberculosis affects mainly the anterior vertebral column. You get more destruction, you have a preserved posterior column, you get more of an angular kyphosis. And this phenomenon gets much, much more exacerbated in children, where you lose your anterior growth potential because of disease. So you have a situation where your anterior growth potential is destroyed, your posterior growth potential is unabated, so these children, instead of growing vertically, they start growing horizontally. 
So not only it's a compromise in the neurological function, but also compromise in your trunk height. For example, this was a seven-year-old kid. You can see what is called as a buckling collapse because there's a complete cephalid vertebral border, anterior border is touching the super inflate of inferior vertebral body. So he's growing more horizontally. We instrumented, we removed the internal salient, but we cannot restore the trunk height back to normal. So the literature or the word is pretty clear. They talked about the reduction in the vertical dimension of the thoracic cage, which is uh, known to uh, affect this. And uh, as you all see, if you uh, uh, if there is a reduction in the vertebral column, you get a rib, which is going to be impinging on the iliac, and you are going to get a costopelvic impingement. We have seen what is a diaphragmatic dysfunction, and over a period of time, these uh, individuals lose their efficiency of intercostal muscles. So with this hypothesis in mind, we have a normal stiffening of the chest wall with aging. We get a further rigidity in the chest wall because of spinal deformity. On top of that, we try to correct this deformity with a rigid posterior instrumentation and we end up in losing a, a, a significant vertical height of the thoracic column and that leads to increased respiratory work, decreased exercise tolerance and hypercapnic respiratory failure. And this hypothesis we wanted to study. So we decided to determine the relation between the vertebral body destruction, the column loss and its impact on our pulmonary function. As we'll discuss in subsequent slide, there's a literature which is existing with osteoporotic and early onset scoliosis, but no such literature is still present with respect to spinal tuberculosis. So we recruited 50 cases of spinal tuberculosis who presented to our institute with a minimum spinal deformity index score of 2, which we'll see in a subsequent slides. We excluded the patients with a lung disease for obvious reasons like COPD, connective tissue disorders, or the patients who had a loss in the vertebral height because of trauma or surgery. And those who are taking inhalers, which would interfere with our uh, PFT measurement, or those patients who were in a severely debilitating conditions. We use a semi-quantitative uh, method of genant where the vertebral height loss is characterized by 1, 2, and 3, depending on the vertebral body restriction. If it's less than 25%, 25 to 40%, and more than 40%, it is given a score of 3. This was done by the single observer. For example, in this case, there's a T11 vertebral body which has destroyed almost more than 40% score, score given 3, and T12 vertebral body, so partial destruction, so given a score of 1. Total SDI for this patient becomes 4. All of our patients underwent uh, the pulmonary function test in our state-of-art uh, pulmonary function laboratory at KEM hospital, where we use a body box plethysmography, which not only calculates the other function, but also it calculates the total lung capacity, which becomes very important in a case the child is not able to do a breathing efforts. We use various spirometry variables like force vital capacity, FEV1 value, which is the amount of air which you exhale in a first second of your exhalation, and we classified the restrictive lung disease depending on your force vital capacity. And mild was given a score of 60 to 80 percent, and the CVR was given a score of less than 50 percent. We use American Thoracic Society classification for obstructive lung disease, where the mild was graded more than 70 and severe was graded less than 59. Whenever the patient was not able to do a breathing effort, we use uh, 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 this uh, DICOM images where we, uh, this particular software uh, measures the air density shade of the lung and it calculates the total lung based on the summation of the thoracic lung volume uh, over uh, multiple sections in a CT scan. So ultimately we get a, a 3D dimensions uh, reconstruction of the lung and we get a total lung capacity measured. Another important point which I would like to emphasize upon is that whenever we do a PFT, we get something called as actual value and there is something called as a predicted value. And your predicted value are derived based upon your age and height. Most of this pulmonary function test center will use a recorded height as a marker. And if you put a recorded height where the child has or an individual has lost multiple vertebral body, you are going to put a shorter height and your pulmonary function tests are going to be become spuriously normal. So it's very important that one has to ask specifically as arm span height as a surrogate marker for the estimation of predicted value. And we know that from a uh, pretty ancient period that your total body height is equal to arm span height and this is a perfect square. Just to emphasize the same thing, we had a 10 year old female who had a difficulty in walking since five year defaulter. We had a discharging sinus in the upper back she had thoracolumbar kyphosis. This is what we classically see, trunk limb asymmetry, longer li upper limb and lower limb, but shortened trunk, discharging sinus and sp uh, spastic neurology. This is her uh, pre-op x-ray. You can see a spinal canal and an AP view, which means the severity of kyphosis. There was a destruction from D9 to L3 vertebral body with preserved posterior elements. When we end up uh, putting a recorded height, which was 108 centimeter, we got a moderate restrictive lung disease, but when we use a total arm span, the 
height was 129 centimeter, and you can see the difference in the terms of pulmonary function result. Similarly, same patient, if you can see in a CT scan, again, the same thing, you, you, you are seeing a significant destruction of the vertebral column anteriorly and uh, a preserved posterior elements, which we call tombstones, which are indicative of anterior destruction and a compression on the spinal cord. We do multiplanar reconstruction because a lot of these patients, kids uh, don't have a, a pedicles to instrument, so it becomes a very difficult job. Uh, we we removed all the internal salient from the posterior approach. We did a posterior instrumentation. Uh, we did anterior reconstruction with the column. This is our post-operative XA, COP improved significantly. Uh, these are the post-operative image we, where we could pull her trunk back to the maximum that we can do. The cost of pelvic impingement also reduced significantly. Uh, we excise the sinus in the same setting. But again, what is the point? My emphasis is that the one year down the line, we are not able to restore the trunk height to its normal. Now you can appreciate the breathing she's doing is abdominal breathing. This uh, individuals have a thorax which is completely plastic and you want to breathe in and breathe out for that you need a uh, thoracic muscle you want has to create a very significant trans diaphragmatic pressure so they end up using abdominal muscles to create a ventilation so a result showed that we had a 14 males and 36 females with a mean age of 27.9 years this is the pulmonary function test result we had 11 patients with a normal study with a mean SDI of 2.72 we had 12 patients with a mild restrictive lung disease with a mean SD of 3.83. We had 14 patients with a moderate restrictive lung disease with mean SD of 5.64. And we had 10 patients with a severe uh, uh, restrictive lung disease with a mean SD of 6.1. So the point is, as we are getting a reduction in the height of T1 to L5, your lungs are suffering in a proportionate manner. Strangely, we got a three cases of obstructive lung disease as well, in which two cases were a severe obstructive lung disease. So the same point as your spinal deformity index increases, your restrictive lung disorder severity increases. This is a correlation which we found with the spinal deformity index and force vital capacity which was negatively correlated with a correlation coefficient of minus 3.86. Again, FEV1 value also showed a negative correlation with the SDI. FEV1, again you have to understand it's a restrictive lung disease so the amount of air that will be in the lung is less. So the amount of air that you're going to exhale in first second is also going to be less. And that was directly correlated with the SDI with a negative correlation coefficient of minus 0.383. The most interesting thing was this. We found that there's a significant and much stronger uh, a relationship between the FVC and the kyphosis. As the kyphosis is higher, FVC was lower with a negative correlation coefficient of minus 0.21. Another interesting thing which we noted was the apex. The apex of the deformity, if it was located in the upper thoracic spine, the restrictive lung disorder was much severe and FEC ended up in decreasing much more significantly as compared to the apex which was in a lower lumbar or dorsal lumbar spine. So thus the increase in the SDI was associated with the predominantly restrictive pattern. You get a loss of vertical height which causes significant internal displacement of organ and affection of the uh, thoracic muscles to breathe. There's a significant literature which is present for the osteoporosis which discuss about the vertical length from T1 to S1. They have found a linear, graded and dose response kind of a relationship between the loss of vertical column height and the uh, impact on a, a pulmonary function test. Uh, the lengthy group last to last SRS also uh, showed a significant concern even in adult cases. It's not just the kids less than 10 years, but if a deformity sets in a latter part of life, you also tend to get an affection in a pulmonary function test. This study showed, mind you, only 30 degree proximal thoracic curve was affecting the lung function significantly. So traditionally, we've been told that the, uh, the scoliosis more than 90 degree will affect PFT, but one has to consider the age-related decline in the lung function over the long term. What about the, uh, the tuberculosis spine? We got this patient uh, uh, from a medicine ward. He was admitted for a heart failure. They did an x-ray. They found a deformity. We were called. He, this patient had uh, the uh, uh, spinal tuberculosis for which he had taken AKT when he was 34. There was a discharging sinus scar which was present at the back. He had lost almost half of his uh, lumbar, thoracolumbar region. You can see detail which is now nearly sitting on L4 vertebra. Uh, uh, significant again typical trunk limb asymmetry distension of the abdomen, he's in heart failure, and these patients I, I have a very poor prognosis. I, and I suspect that our, our, uh, the post-TB pulmonary deformity also have a higher morbidity and mortality. Just because we don't have a long-term data, the cases that we receive at KM is migratory population, underprivileged class, we don't have a follow-up for 30 to 40 years, but just we don't know it, so that doesn't that disapprove the thesis. And my assumption is based upon the fact from the early onset scoliosis. 
the Western literature is very clear. Whenever there's a loss of vertical column height, there's a significant morbidity and mortality in third and fourth decade of life. We don't have that data as of now for a spinal tuberculosis. So pulmonary compromise in our study was also with a multiple factor, including kyphosis angle, level of kyphotic apex, and the number of involved vertebra. The limitations of our study was arm span being used, the relatively small sample size, semi-quantitative grading, and cross-sectional analysis of PFT. So there is a lot of work which we are still carrying on. We are following this patient for a long term. We are comparing the preoperative and postoperative values. The preliminary data shows there is no significant improvement in the first two years, which is similar to the uh, Western population. They also are lacking a long term study. Al almost quarter of these patients improve, quarter deteriorate, and half remain the same in spite of doing a surgery. So understand that your surgery may increase further rigidity and does not necessarily lead to increase in the pulmonary capacity. I had applied for a growth preservation surgery uh, funding for SRS last year, where I received a very favorable uh, uh, consideration from the SRS Research Grant Committee. We are also focusing on the pediatric sample size in isolation with the adult uh, 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 cases. So what next? Is the lung function salvageable? We don't have any data about that. If so, how? We need to do a long-term uh, prospective study. Does lung function improve with certain intervention that others? Yes, there are various cases, open wedge thoracoplasty, growth preservation, but their implication in a spinal tuberculosis is a matter of uh, application and when, uh, when we'll have a lot of logistical and technical difficulty. And is the timing of intervention important? Yes, it's very much important. Earlier you interview, less is the loss of spinal column. There are certain critical area which we would like to and which we are focusing on. Main is the intercostal muscle preservation. We have one need to visit the revisit the rib sternum relationship, the costovertebral joint integrity. What does this mean? That we should resect the lesser number of ribs when we are approaching the anteriorly and try to preserve that and just not look at the spinal column. Sp the thorax is a fifth or fourth dimension of the thorax, and this is a domino effect. So the thorax, your lungs, and your spinal column has to be complementary and supplementary to each other and there has to be a harmonious relationship between these, uh, these all factors. The diaphragm, as I uh, showed you previously, is a very important and uh, we, are, we are seeing that this diaphragm gets completely stretched because your attachment is in the uh, dorsal lumbar region and when we are correcting this, there's a reduction in the stretching. You have to understand the diaphragm is like a piston. It has to move up and down to suck in the air and suck or, or the exhale the air. If your diaphragm is abnormally stretched because of your deformity, you are going to lose a lot of uh, respiratory function. Fortunately, when we are correcting this deformity, we are seeing a dome of the diaphragm being restored and the, uh, the stretching is decreased. We are working on that, that how much impact does it have on a pulmonary function in the long term. Thus, in conclusion, the loss of multiple vertebrae and TB spine has a deleterious effect on a pulmonary function. It warrants a multidisciplinary approach and not just an orthopedic approach. Your pulmonary function testing should be standard of care, especially in a patient with a multiple vertebral body loss. And decline in lung function over time, one has to keep this in mind. And it is very important to address such patients in early stage before there's a rampant destruction of the vertebral column. Because we, uh, I, I'm not sure with the current treatment that we are offering, whether these kids go to fourth or fifth decade of their life. These are my references. 